Augmented and virtual reality have been around for a long time, and we've all heard many of the use cases. The hospice care patient who visited the Grand Canyon before she passed. A therapy tool for people with hoarding disorder. Training for medical students learning how to perform procedures. Even applications to help people overcome phobias like the fear of spiders. You've seen augmented reality in use if you've ever watched sports on TV. That yellow line indicating the first down? That's AR. And if you or anyone you know has played Pokemon Go, well, obviously. But how do we use immersive technology like this to sell our brands? The Australian wine brand 19 Crimes is a perfect example. 19 Crimes refers to the British prisoners who were sent to Australia instead of the gallows in the 18th century. They were supposed to have violated one of the infamous 19 crimes of the time, including clandestine marriage, bigamy, or stealing letters. When you buy the wine, there's an image of a former convict. You download the free mobile app, hold it up to the image, and the character suddenly animates, explaining their side of the story. I've lived through toil and hardship. Punishment for leading a gang of thieves. Years at the labor factory. But I've paid my price. It's a wonderful way to immerse people into a narrative around your brand, providing a richer experience. As a soldier, I fought for country. As a rebel, I fought for cause. As a man, I fought for freedom. My name is James Wilson. And I fight to the end. Today, on Stories and Strategies, the University of Oregon has introduced the first master's program in immersive technologies, and it's only available online, helping us put the AR, VR, and even XR in PR. My name is Doug Downs. Okay, music off the top. Walking theme, the Pokemon Go song, published by Niantic Inc. and the Pokemon Company, composed by Yunichi Masuda. A couple of thank yous off the top of the episode. James Jenna left us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts in the United States. Thank you, James. And Francesca Masonav left us a comment on Spotify. Quote, From Puerto Rico's stunning shores, I appreciate your incredible podcast. It's been invaluable for my career. The quality of content, remarkable guests, and perfect intros are truly amazing. Francesca, gracias por decir esto and for tolerating my clumsy Spanish. By the way, if you're listening on Spotify, you can leave a comment specific to any episode, including this one. My guest today is Donna Davis, joining today from Florida. Hi, Donna. Hello, Doug. Thanks so much for having me. And you're in Gainesville? Where are you at? Well, today I'm in Orlando, well, Winter Park, Florida. and um, But home is Portland, Oregon. Right, right. Typically, but you're visiting family in, in Orlando. So I nice, am. Warm and sunny today, I'm sure. It's stunning. It's very beautiful and very warm. I'm I'm used to my cold, rainy fall. <laughs> it's not going to complain. Lots, lots of that here for you. So we've got that covered. Donna, you're an associate professor and the director of the University of Oregon's Immersive Media Communication Master's Program and the Oregon Reality Lab. You have your PhD in mass communication from the University of Florida, where you studied relationship formation in 3D immersive virtual environments. You have a Master of Science in Family, Youth, and Community Service, and a BA in Journalism and Public Relations, both also from the University of Florida. You are an inaugural faculty fellow for the School of Journalism and Communication, Agora Journalism Center for Innovation and Civic Engagement. And you've written several publications on virtual reality and social and economic impacts. We've provided a link to those in the show notes. Now, Despite all that stuff, Donna, yes. let's go back to the high school or even middle school level um, and define first what 
immersive media means. Okay. Um, Immersive media represents all of the emerging technologies that we're um, all of us are using, whether we realize it or not, that can be um, using your cell phone, your smartphone to, for augmented reality. It could be using your laptop for gaming spaces. It could be your gaming console. It could be, um, we think of it as AR, VR, XR, Web3, um, AI, <laughs> alphabet soup there. But um, so a Meta Quest or, a, or HTC Vive, the VR headsets. XR are the headsets like the Microsoft HoloLens, you know, so where you can blend realities, if you will. And in each of these realities or technologies, it's really almost like you're leaping into and immersing yourself in the screen, whichever screen it is that is in front of you. And the idea is that I, as part of the audience, I feel more involved that there's parts of my brain that are um, not being fooled, but, but, but they're openly engaging with the activity that's going on. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's all sorts of really wonderful research that talks about um, that ability of, for our brain to really take us there. It's being present in the experience um, in a way that um, I have watched so many people I'll take them on an adventure in virtual reality in uh, in a VR headset. And when they take it off, it's always like, whoa, I'm in this world. Because to them, their brain was there. They were completely immersed in that experience. So it's almost like where we're transporting ourselves into an experience through these emerging technologies. Some people would argue it's very Marshall McLuhan, you know, that some people can be immersed in reading and words. And, te- you know, in text. Um, and some for some people, that's probably more immersive because their brain creates this experience through words. Um, it, so I, I don't want to let completely go of legacy media, but the focus in this program and immersive media is, are these technologies that transport us in a much more psychologically powerful way. Now, is it, is it fair to say that AR, VR, um, XR hasn't quite caught on at the the rate of adoption that we were once envisioning? And maybe there are a couple of things there. I've had experience with VR, a, a lo- most of it excellent. But at times, like you get that experience of where you're on the roller coaster and I had to take the headset off. I was feeling nauseous. I was fe- starting to feel The other is it hasn't necessarily caught on at home because I don't have a headset at home. Right. I I don't carry the headset, right? Right. Is it it fair to say that the rate of adoption hasn't quite picked up the way we thought it might? Totally fair to say. And I think that that's also a, I mean, um, I've written with colleagues about this and that barrier to adoption at the level that we expect these days with emerging technologies that are social technologies. If you think about the the size of platforms like TikTok and Facebook and Instagram and, 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 um, you know, that adoption is worldwide in, in an enormous way. But that's because every, nearly everybody today, the saturation level of a cell phone or again, a smartphone, these are things that you can um, really access out of a device that we all typically carry with us. So as a result of that, AR jumped right over VR in terms of mass adoption. Because So you think about augmented reality, things like Snapchat, um, or um, there are, or even now there are a lot of marketers that are using AR, so like Ikea, um, you can, or House where you can download a piece of furniture that you think you might want. You can scan your room and then it'll dump that piece of furniture into your room so that it you'll know exactly what it looks like in your space. So for those people who have bought something, brought it home and go and realized, oh my goodness, this is way too big for our space or it's way too small for our say, space. Now you can test it with augmented reality from your cell phone with a simple app or you can 
try on glasses with Warby Parker, you know, and, and get the, the, you know, and see exactly how they're going to look on your face without having to go anywhere. And so those kinds of um, uses of technology like augmented reality ha- and Pokemon Go, as you were <laughs> playing the song. Yeah. Um, you know, we saw that go very, very viral back in, I guess it was 2018 or 19. Um, that is augmented reality. When it comes to virtual reality, yes, the adoption has been much slower. And it's interesting because what it was two years, three years ago, where one of the top words of the year was metaverse and Facebook renamed, rebranded to meta Mm -hmm. and was saying VR is the future and we're all in. And so you can look at it through two lenses. One is we think of the adoption curve where um, the classic adoption curve that we've, you've got the early adopters all the way through to the laggards and it's a real nice bell curve. But then you throw in a hype cycle (laughs) and it throws all of that off. What happens is we get the hype has been so big, was so big around the metaverse that it couldn't help but fall into what's known in the hype cycle as the trough of disillusionment. And um, that's where it is right now because it didn't match at the top of the hype cycle is the peak of inflated expectations. And that's what the, the media did was they created this incredible peak of inflated expectation that the market couldn't match. And when that happens, you fall into that trough. So, and it didn't happen for a number of reasons. One is that the headsets are still very expensive for the average person. So you've got um, an automatic a barrier to mass adoption simply by virtue of the cost. Then you also had people with motion sickness. I am one of those people that suffers really extreme motion sickness. I've, I've been in labs where people will put me in a headset and, and say, well, try it, try it. And uh, one was um, a motion VR where they train race uh, race car drivers using virtual reality, put on a headset, you're sitting in the chassis of the race car, they even put the gloves on you. So you feel like you've got control of the wheel. And your acceleration and brake is driven by you. But you're what and you're seeing it in the headset. I ripped that thing off my head before I got around the first curve. And I thought I was going to get sick. And they said, Okay, you are the person we need to be able to get through this because if you can do it, anybody could do it. So that that target of how do we get this right so to get rid of that motion sickness um, it has to happen. Uh, and you figure early people who tried it early where they call it the screen door effect, where there's almost this layer of screen door between you and the reality, which throws our brains off that causes a lot of that motion sickness. Yeah. And they have made massive improvements on that. But if you were one of the people that tried it early and got really sick, you might say, I'm never going to try that again. You know, so they, they got some people on that hype that they then may be permanently lost. Um, and then you also have content. So, you know, what kind of content is out there? And there have been, it's been limited out other than the game spaces. Content has been very slow to populate. It's costly for what has been up to now a pretty small audience, a niche audience. So um, there's that combination of factors that have caused it to grow at a much slower rate than it was anticipated. And I would even point out that that slower rate is still very healthy. There is still very steady growth in these spaces, just not at the, um, we saw what happened with ChatGPT and um, uh, they experienced faster adoption than anything ever in history. It grew so quickly. Um, So you've got technologies, again, anybody with a computer can get to it. And um, so mass, mass, mass adoption. Hey, I've got another podcast idea for you. We all know that marketers are facing constant new challenges and you got to stay ahead of the curve. That's why you should listen to Building Better CMOs. 
It's a podcast about the challenges that marketers face and what you can do to make your marketing stronger and smarter. You'll get fresh insights from marketing leaders at Heineken, Adobe, AT&T, Uber, FanDuel, and more. So follow Building Better CMOs wherever you get your podcasts or go to bettercmos.com. That, that, <clears throat> the hype cycle that you, you touched on at the beginning there, I think you might have just explained the cryptocurrency market to me, but that, that's, a, that's a whole other episode, that the hype and then the inevitable right. letdown, right. right? It's not that it doesn't work. It's just, uh, but anyway, um, with ChatGPT, though, really, it's just a Google replacement. Instead of using Google, I use ChatGPT, right? A slightly different function. So I'm already familiar, right? Or at least I think I am. I'm not really because I'm not a prompt engineer so to speak, with AR, VR, especially VR, as you mentioned, the separation between the two, I am unfamiliar with this. So I do need something like a screen door to help my brain and to help me mentally acclimate to it. Well, and I I think um, media literacy is already such a problem for humanity, right? (laughs) Um, People have a really hard time understanding how to, um, how to process everything that's coming at us in so many different ways um, that uh, our brains can't keep up with the pace of change of technology in general. And certainly I think um, chat GPT and AI are different in that you're right. People had a certain element of understanding already because if you've ever done use search, um, whichever platform you use, you know, you know, or spell check or grammar check or right. um, Alexa. These are all the devices that are in our world already that are AI that we are accustomed to. Right, right. And and the other really important piece is that ChatGPT is not only very easily accessible, it's also very intuitive, easy to use. Whereas with... Um, other technologies, if you're especially AR, uh, not AR, but virtual reality, extended reality, uh, or blended reality, there tends to be more of a learning curve to understand how to use the technology. We, see, I mean, my happy playground where I've been studying communities for now um, almost 16 years uh, was Second Life, which we now think of as legacy media, if you will, in this space. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's still thriving. It's 20 years old and um, has a has a bigger base of people than it ever did before. It's a very profitable company. It meets all of those um, standards of success in just about every way you could imagine. Their limit to uh, their limitation to broader adoption is complex. But one of them is that they're not, uh, you can't access it on mobile, you know? So, you know, you think about, again, how and why and to what effect do we use all of these devices and for what purpose? Um, It's the mobile phone. If you do it on a mobile, you're going to hit, and it's easy, you're going to hit way bigger numbers way faster. The more complex the technology is, the slower it will be to adoption the more um, expensive it is, the slower it will be to adoption. So, um, but, uh, you know, we're finding at a university level, we're having to really jump on um, AI because our our students are already using it. So that goes, right. So it's like, as we think about, well, golly, this is something new and I'm not sure I'm comfortable with it. While the kids are running circles around us going, oh, but it's awesome. (laughs) You know, so, you know, I think, all of these things, if you think about it, um, so much of this back in the day when X was Twitter or when Meta was Facebook, they went massive because the kids, it was high school and college kids that just flocked to it and it blew up. And from there, it, it spread out to the rest of us. Your master's program, the University of Oregon, yes, it's all virtual. Um, yes. Take me through what you're teaching. I'm not, I was about to say the kids, <laughs> the students, w- what are you teaching the students and, and how is this going to lead? Because ultimately part of your goal has to be to encourage faster adoption amongst folks like me. 
Well, and that's, um, we're super excited about this program because it's the first of its kind. There are, uh, there's plenty of other programs out there that address all of these technologies, either from studying it from the psychological perspective, like they do at Stanford and the engineering behind it. And there are a lot of great labs out there doing really great work and, and programs that are, you know, in the engineering schools that are building these technologies or computer science and game development programs where people are learning, learning how to build content in these spaces. But we're really coming at it through that lens of strategic communication, that these are tools in our arsenal, if you will, that we can use to build community, build identity, build awareness, build advocacy, all of the, if you think of all of those traditional goals that we have, whether it's in advertising, public relations, marketing, all of the things that we've used in the past have um, always been dis disruptive, right? So um, I tell my, my kids, um, when I was an undergrad, I used, my tools were a pica ruler and a proportion wheel and hot wax and an exacto knife. You know, that was even pre page maker, if you remember page maker and um, pre internet. So when you think about it in that context of how rapidly all of these things have changed, um, and now with these new emerging technologies that are really immersive, what we hope to do with this program and with our students is help them become the strategists, um, the leaders in the field, the thinkers in the field that will go back and help organizations that are right now scratching their heads going, what is this and how do we use it and why would we use it and who, who would we want in there? And um, there are some big brands that are already in full on you especially you look at game spaces like roblox and how many brands are now in roblox it's astonishing and to great effect yeah i mean there was a lot of buzz two years ago when nike built nike land in roblox and the millions of visitors they had to Ro in roblox were outpacing the numbers in their stores wow so you look at the way we've changed the way we shop, the way we live, the way we play, the way we socialize, you know, more people meet online to get married today than they do meet in old tradi in traditional ways. Um, so we lo are looking at all of these technologies and trying to create the thought leaders of the future and the people that are going to be driving um, the strategy behind it so that as I go back to hype cycle, there was so much press around, this is going to be the next big thing and everybody's going to be there. And then oops, they weren't. So you see cases like the EU spending millions of dollars to create an anniversary experience in VR and six people showed up. It's going to take time. It's going to take yes. some time. But yes. with a course yes. like this, it accelerates because it's a, it's a, a concentration of students focused on an agreed to outcome that this is a way to engage and enthrall more people. So uh, I applaud what you're doing. Thank, thank, thank you. you so much for your time today, Donna. It's great to connect with you. Likewise. And um, yeah, we're super excited about what's happening and we're already seeing our first cohort um, is astonishing in there from all four corners of the U S and they're, um, chatting in um, our discussion boards in ways that is teaching me every day. It's very, very exciting. That's awesome. Well, enjoy the reality, the warm weather in Orlando. Thank you so much. If you'd like to send a message to my guest, Donna Davis, we've got a contact information on X in the show notes, as well as a couple of links to that university program. It's all virtual, definitely worth having a look at. Stories and Strategies is a co-production of JGR Communications and Stories and Strategies podcasts. If you like this episode, do us a favor, immerse a friend in this podcast, share it with them, and please do leave a positive rating. Thanks for listening. <laughs>